can be turning over to Exodus 40. Be the final chapter tonight. And then uh, Sunday we start a new class. Before we begin class, I'd like to start with a word of prayer. I'd like to ask Mike, if he would, to direct our minds in that prayer. Amen. So a couple things before we get into the text. I couldn't do a class without Charlton Heston as Moses. It's my favorite Moses of all time depictor. Uh, anyway, that's parting the Red Sea since I didn't teach that part. I couldn't show that. But also the Ten Commandments, or the tablets, and some of that depiction really falls short of what it must have really been like. And uh, uh, with the parting of the Red Sea, or some of the things that Moses went through in terms of the burning bush, or delivering the, the law, the tablets, uh, that kind of thing, not even Hollywood could outdo what God actually did. So I want to look at Exodus 40, and the first two verses there says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month you shall erect the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. And then he starts a detailed description of what he should do and how he should do it, and what he should do it with. So it's very detailed, very orderly. Uh, personally, I like that. It's a process and it's steps to go through that God is commanding, which obviously gives us a good example in terms of how we're to order our spiritual lives by God's direction as he has commanded in the, in the process, in the steps that he has commanded. So probably this is mid-March to mid-April, which is typically the end of the winter and the beginning of spring. And in many of the cultures of that time, that was the new year. That's the way people kept track of time. Makes a lot of sense because spring is when things start to come out of the ground again. Uh, the, the earth renews, the plants renew themselves. And winter we look at as being the dead part of the year and uh, that would seem to fit the end of the year. There were some cultures though that during that time uh, around October sometime was when they would have their new year because the end of the year was the harvest and uh, the harvest time and everything had grown up and then been collected in and therefore that would represent uh, the new year to them. This language that he uses here, if we look back at uh, chapter 12 and verse one, when they're preparing for the Passover and therefore the departure from Egypt. It says, uh, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. And then he goes on to tell the congregation about it, etc. So 
this would appear to be about a year later, maybe exactly a year later. And this new year then is linked to the Passover in terms of timing of the year. And it's also the establishment of the formalized or the codified law that God is giving. He hasn't given this law before. This is new to the people. And if you note the furniture that is used, and if you look at the descriptions, which we're not going to take in detail in the latter part of this, the rest of the chapter, but if you look at it, the things that uh, for the furniture, many of those items had poles to carry the Ark of the Covenant as an example. But in addition to that, the other altar and some of the other items called furniture. And uh, there's probably a good reason for that. One thing, these were probably heavier pieces. A lot of these pieces were gold, especially the Ark of the Covenant, even those relatively small box uh, still would have been heavy. And also done that way for quick assembly and quick takedown. In other words, the way that he describes to build the tabernacle and the order that he goes in sets this up in the most efficient way to assemble the, to the totality of the tabernacle and the courtyard. But it also, you know, they didn't know when they were going to be leaving. So they would set it up. Uh, they needed to set it up fairly quickly. And then they needed to be prepared whenever the cloud moved, when they were directed by God or the pillar of fire. Then uh, they were in the process then of getting ready to go. And it would make sense that this tabernacle, which is indicative of the presence of God and how he wants his people to look at him, uh, that they need to be ready to pick it up and get going. So, another thing this emphasizes is that they're sojourners. And that word is very important in the Bible. They were sojourners. That means they traveled. And they were not citizens. They weren't citizens of Egypt. They were not citizens in the wilderness where they were traveling. They looked for their citizenship, if you will, in the promised land. And so that's where they were headed. But in the meantime, they were sojourners, they were pilgrims, they were aliens, they were strangers. These different terms are used about them. And of course, that calls to mind in the New Testament, those terms are also used for us as Christians. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because we're looking forward to our home, our rest, to heaven, to the eternal. And this, as the song says, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. And uh, again, it reminds us as Christians, we're to have the same attitude and similar attitude that they had back then about uh, when they were sojourning to get through the land to get to their rest or their home or the promised land. So we could look at uh, 1 Peter 2. 11 and 12, I'll be turning over there. And he says uh, there, beloved, obviously this is Peter, I urge you as sojourners and exiles or pilgrims to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. So he's talking in a spiritual context here, but he's still identifying those people, those Christians, 
as sojourners and exiles, reminding them, don't get used to this world. Don't fall in love with the things that are in this world because there's something better that's waiting for you. There's something better down the road, time-wise. And so uh, this reinforces that in the New Testament there. And you could look at 1 Chronicles 29.15, Leviticus 25.23. We're not going to look at those, but those are other passages that indicate we're in a temporary home, a temporary nature. We pick up and we move and we go other places. Very similar to our thinking as, what our thinking should be as Christians. We can see behind this that God has purpose in what he's accomplishing with his people. They're a new people, if you will. They've, they've, it's, it's really amazing when you think about <clears throat> Abraham, one person, one wife, uh, and from them they have Isaac, one person, and Isaac has two, Jacob and Esau. How in the world is this promise of uh, this great nation, uh, the people that are like the sand on the beach, the people that are, are numbered like the, the stars in the sky, meaning there's going to be a bunch. And in about 400 years, roughly, we see that now there's two, three, four million people that have come together out of what started out as one old man and one old woman. Basically, God uses his way to get things done in his time, his means. So there's purpose, there's planning in what God has done here to make things appropriate. And we're going to talk more about that. There's a process and to me, the term process indicates activities and steps that are taken in progression over time to achieve some end. And that's what God is doing here with his people. So, what if... Now, he's got this pattern. And by the way, the pattern and copy of things are talked about several times in the New Testament, at looking back on the pattern of things, not because the pattern was perfect, but because it was headed toward perfection under Jesus Christ and the church, and uh, eventually when we all are reunited in heaven. But there's a pattern. What if there's a change? What if Moses said, you know, Seems like to me, starting with the Holy of Holies and then working to the holy place and then working outside to the courtyard and putting uh, the, the uh, altar and the brass laver out front to cleanse stuff, to sacrifice. What if we start out there and then we come inside and work on that first? Uh, what if when we break it down, we don't do it in the reverse order, but we decided to start in another order? Would that have been right? We know the answer to that, just the way I asked that question. No, that's not right. So therefore, when we look back to the Bible, more specifically the New Testament and how things are done, how God has set up, through Jesus Christ, the church, and what's supposed to be done there, it begs the question, well, what if we do things just a little different? What if we do this? What if we do that? And the point I'm trying to make is uh, change because we think it's better or it's okay is not necessarily the right way to go. D, were you going to? Yeah, that's right. And, and if we get to it to the, tonight, in the book of Numbers, we have the case of Nadab and Abihu, <clears throat> who made a little change, apparently. 
uh, they offered up a strange sacrifice and a strange fire. And this did not please God to the point that they were killed because of their uh, changing the pattern, if you will. So in terms of getting a pattern from God, getting a type, get, not a type, but getting the way to do things, we make a mistake if we substitute our think-sos for how God has prescribed things. <clears throat> so let's look at how the tabernacle was set up. First of all, just a picture. And this picture depicts the setup. Uh, it shows this is during the day. The cloud is over the whole, most holy place. Uh, the courtyard is set up and the various area for the priests to go in and do their sacrifices and the barrier that is set up around this courtyard and it tells how many poles to put in. It even tells the orientation of this house of meeting, if you will, or the presence of God. And that is that at the bottom where the door to go into this is, the entrance to this is, that's to be on the east side. And I've got another diagram where I'll have the uh, directions there all pointed out. But anyway, that's a guess. And then the, the tribes were encamped around in special order. And they were, had certain places that they were supposed to be. We'll take a look at that in a minute. Okay, so at night, it may have looked something like that, who knows. But just to get a depiction of the uh, pillar of fire, and they didn't know when God was going to move, they didn't know when things would change. They needed to be at the ready, as he commanded, to be at the ready. And possibly it would have looked something like that. Okay, now here's another diagram. And <clears throat> can't see all the details here. You probably can't even read them. That's small print. But I've got another diagram following this. I'll show that in just a minute. But we see the uh, most holy place is up in this area and the holy place is right here and then the courtyard the outer courtyard and then here's <clears throat> the entrance gate which is as you see from down here this is on the east and there's an order in order to make a sacrifice on the brazen altar to wash off the labor of water and then inside are these various items and then outside are the tribes encamped. So, not e exactly in exact proportion, but it's an indication of how it would have been set up. By the way, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was in the uh, Holy of Holies, or the Most Holy Place. What were the contents of the Ark? Three major items, sorry. Right. Right. And these, um, there's some discussion about whether Aaron's rod and the golden pot of manna uh, that, that were in there, whether they were actually outside the Ark of the Covenant, because some of the other readings of the placement of this indicate that might have been the case. But we think certainly they would have been all put together for transportation purposes when they were moving. And uh, the Aaron's rod that was in there, uh, there was an occasion where upon one of the rebellions that um, Moses had each tribe bring a rod uh, to be placed overnight in this area. And then they looked at it in the morning and Aaron's rod is the one that not only bloomed or blossomed, but it also had almonds on it. 
it had fruit, it bore fruit. And so that was an indication that the tribe of Levi was uh, consecrated and set apart for the priesthood. And so that was a very important uh, thing for them to carry. Okay. Let's see. I was going to look at Hebrews 9.4. I appreciate what Jeremy said uh, the other day. If, if you're not looking at Hebrews in light of the book of Exodus, you're just missing a whole lot. Because the, the initiation and the start of a lot of what is in the book of Hebrews is from the book of Exodus. Okay, so Hebrews 9.4. <clears throat> okay, I will start in verse 1. It says, Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent, or a tabernacle, was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence, or the loaves, and it is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was the second section, uh, which is called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And then it describes the Ark of the Covenant above it with a cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. <coughs> For one thing, you've already been spoken of in detail back in Exodus. Uh, the reader should have been aware of that and probably were. Okay. Another thing... Um, in terms of the placement of the tribes around the outside area, outside of this, um, were 12 tribes, but obviously Levi was not one of them. So the two tribes under, the two half tribes, if you will, under Joseph were included in that. So Manasseh and Ephraim were included with that um, and then Levi the Levites would have been doing the ministration on, inside in the courtyard and in the holy place and finally the most holy place there's some elements here that if we look at it to me just uh, cry out for fulfillment in the New Testament and let me give one that's a little clearer than the other one that I had of the tabernacle there. Uh, the only thing I don't like about this illustration is whoever I borrowed it from spelled the altar of burnt offering with an E instead of an A. And um, that drives me crazy, <clears throat> misspellings like that. It just jumps out at me. Anyway, so... This would have been the east where the entrance is. Therefore, this is north, south, and west over here. And it had to be placed in this direction always. They couldn't shift it around. I don't think they were told don't shift it around, but the fact they were told to do it this way eliminates other possibilities. That's something else we need to take into account as, as we look at uh, the New Testament. Okay. Yes. Of having the entrance point east? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> uh, does anybody have any idea? Of, of the, Zach? Sunrise and sunset was a big thing with the. True. So sunrise would have been on the east coming up, and then sunset uh, on the west. Whew. Thank you. I wouldn't have called on you, Zach, for that. 
We teachers should be exempt from that. Where's Jeremy? I want to tell him I've learned what an ephod is since he asked me. Okay, there are three elements here to me that are consistent through the Bible. There's a thread all the way through the Bible of these three elements. And this is just my opinion. Uh, One of them is blood. There's blood at the altar for the sacrifice for them to get into this area. And we know that Abel's blood is the first place we really read about blood. His blood cried out from the ground uh, for justice, uh, for his murder. And then we know during the Passover, there was blood that was used. The hyssop was dipped into the blood to mark the lintel and the side post. Uh, in order to indicate to what is called the destroyer that when God went through, he would indicate to the destroyer not to uh, uh, kill the firstborn within that structure and so or within that family. And so there again we have blood that is preserving the life, if you will, of those that are appealing to that blood. And then, of course, we have Christ on the cross and his blood being shed. And much is said about that. Let's go back to Hebrews and look at, uh, we'll go over to Hebrews 9. And it's a long passage here. I really don't want to take the time to go through all that. So I'm going to pick out some of the highlights. If you want to turn over to 9, I don't have this on on the overhead or anything. Not an overhead anymore on the PowerPoint up here. But when Christ appeared as a high priest, verse 11, chapter 9 of Hebrews, of the good things that have come, Then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation or the the old creation, he, Christ, entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. He says in verse 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And it goes on to say, therefore he's the mediator of a new covenant, Moses in effect being the mediator of the old covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promise, eternal inheritance. And I'm gonna skip down. Verse 23, thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. And what are the rites? The sprinkling of the blood, uh, the offer of the sacrifice, the cleansing of the, at the uh, labor. And it says, because without the shedding of blood, verse 22, there's no forgiveness of sins. So we get the tie in there to that blood from ancient times up to current times. And again, back in verse 23, it's necessary for the copies of the heavenly things be purified these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ, verse 24, has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear (coughs) in the presence of God on our behalf. Verse 26, latter part, he has appeared once for all, not year after year, once for all, at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, 
We might as well finish through the rest of the chapter. Verse 27, And just it is it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. <coughs> so, we see that that blood is carried forth there in Christ's sacrifice. And so, the echo of that, if you will, is like at the altar of a burnt offering. Uh, and the, the other various sacrifices that they made. But it even goes beyond that to the Lord's Supper. For at the time of Passover, which is one of the three feasts they were commanded to remember, uh, at the time of Passover, in all the Gospel accounts, as an example, Matthew 26 through 28, um, he talks about what his blood, Christ talks about, as he's instituting the Lord's Supper, what his blood represents. I'll go ahead and turn over there, Matthew 26, 28. And he says, uh, right prior to that, 27, he took cup, when he given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. But it was poured out, his blood was poured out for many, so therefore, when we're taking part in the Lord's Supper, the echo back to that is back to the blood sacrifices that were offered. Christ offered his sac blood sacrifice of himself, and we remember that every Lord's Day when we're partaking of the Lord's Supper. That's the depth and that's the length of time that we're looking at in, in terms of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Okay. Um, you could also look at 1 Corinthians 11. That's another longer passage where it talks about the fruit of the vine and what that's offered for is the blood of Christ. Okay, another element that it seems like to me is all the way through the Bible is bread. And bread, again, you go back to the Passover in Exodus 12:8. <clears throat> And they're instructed to use unleavened bread. Very specific. Unleavened bread. And they're to take part of that, really as they're standing up, as they're, they're indicating they're getting ready to travel. There's an urgency associated with this. Um, and at any rate, that's one of the things they're doing is eating unleavened bread. As they get into the wilderness then they take manna, which is described in Exodus 16.4 uh, and other places through 31 as bread from heaven. That's the way it's described. And I don't know that it was exactly the same elements as you would make with bread, like the bread of the Passover, the unleavened bread, but it was described as bread from heaven. Therefore, bread as a necessity for life is indicated in the lives of the children of Israel as they're traveling through the wilderness. And then they keep the uh, uh, golden bowl, the golden pot of manna in the Ark of the Covenant as a reminder of that. That bread's being provided. But the real bread is talked about in the New Testament. And in John 6, there's a lengthy discussion on this. We'll not look at all of that. Where Christ has fed the 5,000, he's fed the fish and the loaves of bread. And he launches into a discussion and he says, I am the bread of life. Now that may not seem that big a deal to us, we look at that and we understand the concept that he's representing there. 
But most of the people that heard that were horrified. How can we eat of him? It's like cannibalism. This, this doesn't make sense. And many left him. In fact, the majority of people left him. And if you look at John 6, I, to me, that's a, a great story that's described there. Um, like in verse 66, they're abandoned. And then it's uh, um, Christ says, are you going to abandon me also? And he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? We, Peter said that. He steps up and makes the obvious comment. So, the Lord, whom shall we go? And then beyond that, in the Lord's Supper, again, we have the reminder of that bread. To me, the reminder of the manna. Uh, bread as the sustenance, but primarily Jesus as the bread of life. And then finally, we have uh, water as mentioned throughout. And uh, water, as they're going into the, the uh, wilderness, there's water that comes forth, uh, the, the bitter waters that are turned sweet, and then there's water that comes forth from the rock, and um, many other things, the water they used in the laver in order for cleansing of the, the ones that would be going in, cleansing of Aaron and of the sacrifices, and then finally, we see in the New Testament, John's baptism in water, which is indicative of a cleansing. And then, of course, Acts 2.38 and uh, 1 Peter 3.21, where there's a reference to Noah's flood. And the reference there indicating that God used the water to cleanse the world, to get rid of all the bad people, if you will. And Noah and his family are the ones that are left over. Just a remnant, just a few. And that theme is remnant is carried all the way through also. So, God commanded, and Moses did as God commanded, in the right sequence, the right materials, the right time, the right place. And let me quickly go through these. All of those places, it says Moses did as the Lord had commanded Moses. So there's those seven times within a short passage or series of verses there for us. Seven times that's reinforced. Moses did as the Lord had commanded him. And so that is, to me, the writer, Moses, using that reinforcement that this is important to do as God commands. So important after every element, if you will, or phase of this tabernacle being set up, it's going to be repeated. Moses did as the Lord commanded him. Step by step. In verse 33, Moses finished the work. So his job is done in terms of setting up the tabernacle. And something I wanted to uh, um, throw out to you. I saw this in a book somewhere. I can't find the book. I can't find the illustration. This is after uh, when I was a very young Christian. So that was a long time ago. I was about 21 years old at the time. When I saw this, I'm not anywhere near that now, as you know. And I saw a diagram that basically said, if you look at it, the process, the people being in slavery to Egypt, going through the Red Sea, the wilderness wandering, the Jordan River, and then they get to the promised land. And whoever the author was likened that to us being in slavery to sin, as they were in slavery to Egypt. The Red Sea going through, and that in the New Testament, I don't have the passage right here, but that's likened to them going through the Red Sea, them passing through the water, is similar to baptism in, in that regard. Then life, 
Life happens. We're wondering what to do. Where do we go? Looking for the promised land. And then the Jordan River would represent death. And then uh, it's called the rest, the promised land in Hebrews. It's called the rest. And uh, that's a rest we are looking for. And basically this author was saying there's strong parallels there. So I think I'll leave you with that. Is that second bell? Yeah. Okay. Well, we don't get to go through Leviticus and Numbers as I intended to tonight. A lot of good stuff there if you get a chance. We're going to start in uh, Joshua on Sunday morning. Appreciate your kind attention. Appreciate the other teachers and the great job they did. And uh, thank you for your comments many times. We're done.